It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Serge Gauthier, uh, who is a neurologist and psychiatrist currently holding the position of Professor Emeritus in the Departments of Neurology and Neurosurgery and Psychiatry at McGill University. And in addition to this, uh, Dr. Gauthier is a distinguished researcher, academic in the field, uh, having published over 700 papers, I think I saw, as well as having numerous awards, including the Order of Canada. So we are in good hands today. Dr. Gauthier's uh, talk today is titled, Can Dementia Be Prevented? And I wanted to provide some framing as to why this is an important topic for us. Right now, there are over 85,000 people in British Columbia who are currently living with dementia. But by 2050, that number could increase to over 247,000 people. That's a 218% increase. Now, that's if the status quo holds. That if, that's if current trends hold. And that if is an important piece. Because modeling data out of the Alzheimer's Society of Canada uh, raises some interesting questions as to what the future could look like if we could delay for example, the onset of dementia by one year, by five years, by 10 years. So this question around can dementia be prevented is, a, is an important topic for us to explore. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to hand the mic over to Dr. Serge Gauthier to talk about this important topic. Merci beaucoup. Good to see you again. Special hello to the people joining us online for this uh, public lecture. It's a very wise thing you're doing to have a sort of sharing knowledge with the public at large. And um, this is an important topic indeed. Can prevent, dementia be prevented? Certainly can be delayed. And I'll argue why. Uh, this is actually a topic that Dr. Zevan Keshatyorian brought up 20 years ago. He wrote a famous editorial. What if we delay dementia for the average person by five years and 10 years? And the saving was staggering, but it was early days. And as we will argue in the next uh, 50 minutes or so, uh, there are um, good steps in that direction. I have a new clicker. Let's see if it works. Yes. <laughs> yes, at the end of the day. <laughs> so in terms of conflict of interest statement, I am, uh, the, although I'm retired, um, I still provide advice to different um, companies involved in uh, new diagnostic and treatments. And uh, one of my new tasks is uh, editor of uh, a journal called Journal of Prevention of Alzheimer Disease, hence the topic. Overview. So this is the four parts of the presentation. Uh, the slides are available if you wish from the organizers. We're going to first look at the natural history. This is particularly important for the public at large. So there'll be a, a bit of a story uh, about this lady who's now in her 60s and uh, she's getting a little distracted and we'll follow her through uh, the years. Uh, so we'll learn from her experience. Uh, uh, some examples uh, from observational studies. This is something Canadians are particularly good at. They volunteer for research. Even if no specific treatment is offered, they volunteer their spinal fluid and brain scans and blood so we can monitor changes with age. And uh, there's a rapid return on investment, uh, as I will explain for the new blood test we discussed this morning. I'll discuss uh, examples of, observation, of interventional studies. So let's say you find there's a risk factor and then there's a protective factor. How can you prove that if you make this a public health policy, it will have an impact? So the example of finger, F-I-N-G-R, finger study uh, is a classic. And there's a Canadian intervention that's underway, which I'll talk about. And I'll end with uh, more of a philosophical thought. Um, should we discuss prevention as a society or as individuals? And I think we'll bridge the two. So that's the menu. So the first part is this lady who's um, in her 50s or the 60s. Uh, she's uh, here multitasking. Um, she made her tea. She's on the phone and she's looking at whatever. She's healthy cognitively, but she may have in her brain already changes that are silent. Now, we're going to use this frame that you've already seen this morning, but for the audience who's joining us, uh, bear, bear with me. Um, this is a template that we're going to use just to explain changes over time. 
uh, that may precede dementia by quite a few years. And what we're using is a template that explains the natural history of Alzheimer's disease uh, with early changes that may be more mood, um, and then a cognition decline, and then impact on daily life. And that's when you talk about mild dementia. So we're gonna focus for prevention today about before any symptom and when symptoms are very mild or early or mild dementia. So this lady uh, now uh, forgot her password. <laughs> are you worried? You shouldn't be because it happens to all of us, but you have to remember where you put it. <laughs> you have to remember where you put your password. So. This is an example of something happening to all of us. It's normal, um, but she may be a little worried about it. So there's a name for that, subjective cognitive decline. So it's something you will read about in the medical literature. It's kind of universal over age 50, maybe younger in some people, maybe older, later for others, but uh, it's before any significant change and uh, it's something you uh, may be aware, you're a little slower to play uh, your card game, uh, especially if you play bridge like me with my wife who's so good. <laughs> Someday I have subjective cognitive decline if I cannot uh, rem remember the contract. So that's normal, but it's a field of study and uh, some observational studies include such people, they tend to be young, 50, 60 something, and uh, we may find in some of them, in their brain, subtle change in uh, amyloid buildup and tau protein buildup, but um, it's too early to tell which way it's gonna go. Okay, oh, now she's getting forgetful enough that the daughter's worried. Ah. So it could have been she forgot to pick up the grandchildren at the daycare. She may have forgotten to pick up something, uh, uh, some clothes uh, at the cleaners, whatever. It, 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 but it's sufficient that the daughter is picking it up. <laughs> so normally you should go see your doctor now to check on uh, various things. She may be a little depressed. She may take pills for the bladder that are bad for the memory, etc. But it, it, this is also may trigger some uh, concern uh, for the lady. Uh, she She's losing a bit of control of her life. So there's a new name for that, minimal behavioral impairment. And uh, it's a term coined by uh, Dr. Um, Ismail, Zainal, uh, Ismail in uh, to Calgary. Uh, and it's just this uh, non-specific phase of aging where you not as quick as before, not as sharp, and it may cause in some people a bit of um, irritability, social withdrawal. So actually they made a checklist, there you go. And you can have it online. So the people in the, who are listening, just type MBI after my talk. And um, MBI-C is the checklist that was designed by Dr. Zaina uh, Ismail, and uh, you can actually do the test online. And uh, as we said this morning, see how cranky your boyfriend is, uh, go on the checklist. And uh, But this is like normal noise in life. We all have our ups and downs all day, and it's not specific at all for brain aging dementia. It's just a new observation that in some people, as we age, it's sort of a reaction to daily life changes, uh, and it may make you a little more cranky than before. And some of these symptoms may turn out to be more specific about brain aging leading to Alzheimer's. Irritability seems to stand out right now, but it's too early to tell. Okay, so now um, if we test this lady with a paper and pencil test, maybe we'll find that she's not doing as well on the paper and pencil test than she should for her level of education and her age. And the best test is uh, called the MOCA, Montreal Cognitive Assessment. It's used worldwide. Um, here you see it. You can also have it online. Uh, you can practice. And when you go for your test, when you see the doctor, we'll have alternative versions. <laughs> of course, you, you know, we, we know you practice. And so it's out of 30 points. Um, for people who are watching from afar, um, you can do it online. I'll give you, we actually, you see the, 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 the site mocatest.org. And we're trying to validate this for use remotely as a screening tool. And it's used by uh, nearly everyone in the world now. It's been translated in every language. 
Erin, here's your opportunity to sign up as a volunteer online to validate the test it's in its new version. So it could, it could be used as a screening tool for people who are just aging and a little worried or they want to get a baseline to compare with later. So this is something Canadian that we're putting together since the pandemic, um, sort of a self-check that will include the MOCA, the new version, self-administered public app. And uh, if you want to join as a volunteer, there you go, info at mocatest.org. I'm going to, through the talk, give you a hint at how you can participate wherever you are in the country in these various uh, observational studies. So I was mentioning that in, indeed in Canada during the pandemic, there was a group of uh, us who got together and uh, we used some of the already published material and we looked at new material like the MBI is new, the MOCA, new version for online testing. We still need a checklist for um, ability to function in daily life, activity of daily living that's suitable for people who are really independent. So uh, one of the questions I'm sure, I'm sure will be about uh, how good are you with your bridge game? So high level hobbies, this is where you pick up subtle change uh, in high order ADLs, they say. So this is something Canadian that we're putting together. Okay, Our Lady, further on, maybe a year or two later, uh, now she needs help. As you see here, a friend or daughter or uh, a reliable stranger, I hope, is helping her with the finances, <laughs> you see, with a credit card. So she needs help to handle finances. Um, so we've crossed a line. It's not just subjective. It's um, more than... Um, a paper and pencil test uh, change of, uh, let's say, 28 out of 30, one year, 26 out of 30, a year later. She's probably now more like 21 out of 30 on the test. And uh, she crossed the line, uh, and we now talk about dementia, mild dementia. The new term uh, that's used, um, if you read about these conditions, uh, is also important to mention, major neurocognitive disorder. NCD. And in Quebec, it's mandatory when we write reports uh, that have to be filed with the government to mention the term minor neurocognitive disorder is equivalent to MCI, and major neurocognitive disorder is equivalent to dementia. And the old definition we've been using for a year still holds in clinical practice, so it has to be a progressive decline. It has to be more than one a cognitive domain, so it's not just memory, it's, uh, it could be looking for words and looking for your car, <laughs> it could be slowing in making decisions, so executive impairment and memory, and it has to affect daily life, and that's different if you're a man, woman, working, retired, recently retired, long time, so the art is still to find um, if it's significant in daily life. Uh, many people with Alzheimer don't have awareness, lack of insight, and nosognosia, which is a problem to bring them to a medical assessment. And often there's a bit of anxiety depression mixed in with the early symptoms of dementia, so we have to treat that, of course. So just for, to finish with our diagram, we, as you see, we crossed the line, so now we have um, cognitive and functional impairment. So this is what we want to prevent. Uh, we'd like to delay this progression, uh, which is currently probably 10 years or so, from SCI to mild dementia, probably 10, 15 years, maybe. It's still to be defined how long. Um, can we expand that uh, progression to five years? So to summarize this first part uh, of natural history of brain aging and cognition, there are prodromal symptoms. So it's a term we use in medicine to say, uh, and I'll give you an example. Uh, men who have um, restless nights, who have uh, REM behavior disorder, they act out their dreams. It could be a prodrome of Parkinson or Parkinson-like condition, e even 10 years before they get any Parkinson-like symptoms. So for Alzheimer-like condition, it may be some of these nonspecific um, uh, neuropsychiatric symptoms, and um, this mild cognitive impairment, uh, it, which may be stable for five years, and then something happens to tip the balance into mild dementia. Not everyone with mild cognitive impairment will progress to dementia. That's very important to remember. Um, and if we 
uh, diagnose mild cognitive impairment more often because of the interest of the population, we have to make sure they don't lose their driving permit. It nearly happened in Quebec. Some fonctionnaires misunderstood what MCI was, and they actually had a policy which we were able to overturn within one week, thanks to the Alzheimer's Society uh, and everyone else. Look, MCI, you're still functionally independent by definition. So we were lucky, <laughs> but keep your eyes open, people. Yeah, and, and MCI can be reversible. You may have mild cognitive impairment because you have a partial hearing impairment, partial visual impairment, because you take the wrong pills for your bladder and God knows what. This is something pharmacists are very good at. There's a way to calculate uh, with all your pills, the so-called cholinergic load or cholinergic score. So one of the things you can do, any of us, um, if we have some concern about our or somebody else concentration, attention, um, just go see the pharmacist and say, look, these are my pills. Uh, bring them all, <laughs> even those that you buy somewhere else. Um, I don't know if cannabis is legal here. Yeah, anyway, bring everything. And he or she will sort out uh, with a uh, a program, if there's a, a so-called cholinergic load that is sufficient, and then we can start deprescribing things that are not important. And uh, I want to emphasize that there's a systematic effort to measure these subtle changes over time. And um, I won't talk about that today in detail, but just to let you know, there's, uh, there's our attempts in the US to measure um, very subtle cognition, um, and very subtle functional change in people who are still at the subjective cognitive decline stage um, because there's an interest in testing some of the new drugs for amyloid at that very early stage, even before MCI, before dementia. So there are um, volunteers sometimes enrolled just to, to, to fine tune the measurement tools that will be useful for future prevention studies. Okay. Findings and observational studies. So, mise en context. So, for everybody, um, I thought I would explain uh, the uh, our current understanding of Alzheimer's disease just in two or three minutes, so we can then um, link this with prevention. Um, you already got the hint uh, from what I'm saying that before dementia, there's uh, this mild cognitive impairment phase. Um, this is a concept that's been around for close to 20 years. It's uh, true. Uh, most people uh, who have uh, Alzheimer uh, disease, um, if you look back, you can go maybe two, three, four years. Oh yeah, she was a little forgetful, but it wasn't such a big deal. Um, but if she had this person been seen, uh, maybe they would have done the MOCA and some questionnaires and um, monitor her every year and then pick up the change. So it could be retroactive. Once the dementia is obvious, the neighbors can tell, okay, then you look back with the history. Oh yeah, it's been around, it's been, it's been cooking for two, three years. So it's, it's something important that may change the way we diagnose Alzheimer. We may want to go for the pre-dementia stage um, more systematically because this is perhaps the stage where prevention is most effective at the point where you already have symptoms. The prevention we're discussing today is before that. So it's for the average person with no symptom or minimal symptom, not specific. But uh, there is a trend, especially in the US, to, uh, to say that you have Alzheimer's disease even if you have zero symptoms simply because you have amyloid in your brain. And most of the world is against that. It's really, it's like having cholesterol in your blood vessels. Uh, yeah, we all have a bit of cholesterol as we age in some blood vessels, but we may never have any symptom from it. So you, you don't say you have a heart disease if you have just high cholesterol. You just have a risk factor. So that's a debate you may see when you read in lay papers or scientific papers, the, 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 the new definition of Alzheimer. For some people, especially in the US, they say, as soon as you have amyloid in your brain, it's Alzheimer's disease. disease. And most of the world says, no, you just have a, an, an aging brain. <laughs> and... Uh, there are other factors at play that may uh, influence progression. So that's the field. Um, just to um, finish on the sort of mise en context, uh, the beta amyloid deposition in the brain, 
this uh, fragment of a big protein. The fragment is called B42. So it's 42 amino acid. This is over like 20 years before you get any symptom. Some people it's at birth because they have a gene inherited from one of their parents. Also children with Down syndrome, they also have a gene um, on chromosome 21. The, 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 the amyloid buildup starts at birth. For the average person, the amyloid buildup probably starts around age 50. And that may be all you have over a lifetime, nothing else. But there's something happening at some point, silent, it's a neuroinflammation, which seems to accelerate the changes in the synapse, the connections between nerve cells. Um, the, this microglial activation is uh, something Dr. McGear in, here in Vancouver had uh, sort of discovered when he found 35 years ago that if you have arthritis, you're less likely to get Alzheimer. And that was a big reduction in the order of 30%. And the explanation proposed, well, it's because you take anti-inflammatory drugs. So he actually had a, he was a visionary. Now we agree with him that there is a silent inflammation in the brain. We're starting to be able to measure that with special PET scans, um, spinal fluid, blood tests. But unfortunately, over the 30 years that followed his observation, if you give arthritis medicines to people, they, they, you don't see any change. You don't see improvement. You don't prevent anything. If they already have symptoms, they still progress. It seems like there's a sort of narrow window where this treatment would be best, and that would be before you get symptoms. But then you don't want to give um, medicines that can upset your stomach or cause GI bleeds if you, they don't need them. So we need to measure if you do have active inflammation. So all this to say, this is an important um, uh, potential treatment, this uh, silent phase of neuroinflammation that seems to be a bridge between uh, amyloid buildup, tau, this is the middle thing, NFT, neurofibrillary tangle. It's uh, within the nerve cells, uh, the the tau protein is uh, the, the protein that uh, is the sort of the skeleton of the nerve cell. And um, with age, um, it changes a bit its conformation and it, 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 it is, becomes a tangle, which is not functional. And the flow of nutrients doesn't work as well. And uh, the uh, protein also seems to leak out of the nerve cell and can jump into another one a bit like a prion, you know, like a mad cow disease. So it's actually leading to a potential treatment of giving antibodies intra intravenously that would get into the brain and catch the neurofibrillary tangles as they float from one cell to the other. Um, now, over age 90, nearly everyone has amyloid deposition and neurofibrillary tangles, but only half of the people have symptoms. Ah, so what's protecting half of the people we don't know. Um, I'll give you some hints at the end if we have time. I'll just give you one hint now. Uh, most of the men who, who don't have symptoms is because they live with a woman. So I'll say it in another way. For guys, um, have a woman in your life. It's protective. Okay, so there's a third factor that you need to have symptoms over age 90, and it's usually small strokes. So that's not illustrated here, but this is also something established over the past 35 years. The best study to do that was called the nuns study. Nuns gave their brain to a doctor and uh, they were all over 90 and uh, for the same amount of amyloid and tau pathology, those who had symptoms are the ones who had small strokes. So the stroke component of what you may call mixed dementia is actually the best hope we have for prevention right now. So I'll come back to that uh, later. And, um, and then you have your loss of nerve cells and the brain is shrinking. You see that on the MRI and uh, then you get symptoms. So the positive message here is that you can have 20, 30 years of uh, potential interventions um, before you get symptoms. That's the positive message. The mm, not so positive message is that it's complicated and everyone is a bit different. And 
um, if you have a 50 year old person with Alzheimer, it's not going to be the same mix of proteins as a 95 year old. I think intuitively everybody understands that. It's not going to be the same genetic predisposition at all if your mother had Alzheimer at 95 and another family, a mother has Alzheimer at 50. You understand that. So it's not homogeneous. It depends on the age. And um, comorbidities are important. Um, this was brought up this morning in the question period. Um, over age 85, indeed, most people have a, some Alzheimer as a cause of their their dementia, but many of them have small strokes as well. And uh, if you pre prevent more strokes, good for them. They're likely to be more stable. Other people, they have Parkinson-like changes in their brain. So they have different kinds of symptoms and maybe they'll be helped with different kinds of treatments, especially physio and exercise and so on. Okay, this is a diagram that was uh, given to me by one of my colleagues at work, Dr. Rezan Neto. So to make sure I cover all the main factors at play uh, in the disease, um, I mentioned impaired cerebrovascular function. These are the mini strokes. We rarely see big strokes anymore. Mixed, in, mixed dementia is usually very small strokes mixed in with age. Clearance means ab ability to clear the am amyloid beta out of your brain. Inflammatory response I mentioned, it's um, probably something to do with the small cells within the brain, the, the microglia, the astrocytes also are involved. Genetics, I won't discuss in depth unless you wish to in the question period. Comorbidities, it could mean um, many things. Um, uh, diabetes, very common one. Uh, uh, heart failure, kidney failure. So additional problems that have to do with metabolic changes in the brain, uh, they add up. And on the left, you see unhealthy lifestyles. I'm going to focus on that today with you because that's something we can work on. And the point being made here, these are not additive, they're multiplying factors. This is important. Um, so if you're, di if you're diabetic and you, if you have high blood pressure, uh, you have to treat both, not just one. It's going to be the same spiel. Um, if you want to go for protective factors, you should use them all, not just one. So it's no point to be a marathon runner if you're not eating well. You see what I mean? You, you, you have to have a balanced approach. Uh, an example of an observational study that we're running at McGill, um, the equivalent across Canada will be the one by CCNA. Uh, these are cohorts of volunteers. And uh, if you're curious about the one at McGill, you can look up the site. The slides are available, I remind you, if you're interested. And uh, maybe try T-R-I-A-D will work if you Google it. I'm not sure, I never tried it. But at the, point, the point I want to make is, this is something Canadian. We volunteer for these measurements. Uh, ATN is the new definition of Alzheimer's disease. Amyloid tau, neurodegeneration is measured by PET scan, spinal fluid, blood tests. And this is an example of different volunteers who have all the scans every two years and a spinal, and a spinal tap and blood tests. And this is how we found that um, protein buildup in the brain. Uh, uh, by the way, this is one of the volunteers we taught at Alzheimer, and he has no amyloid in his brain. Surprise, 10% of people we say have Alzheimer. They don't have amyloid, so they don't have Alzheimer. They have something else. So this particular gentleman who was 80 and mild dementia, good, good life. He was listening to his wife and his daughter. Uh, he has in red in the middle a lot of tau protein. So it's a special kind of tau predominant dementia. And time will tell uh, if it's a Parkinson-like condition. So uh, as we discussed this morning, uh, this observational work has led to the finding that blood tests, some of them may correlate with what's happening in your brain. Um, it may be usable for observational studies. So possibly in three years, you, when you're 50, just to pick an age, uh, you want to have a checkup for your risk factors for dementia. And uh, one of the blood tests may be that, uh, derived from Canadian uh, volunteers, uh, proteins in the blood that reflect what's going on in your brain. Okay, so this is just the mise en context. So now examples of uh, epidemiological studies. This is the most important slide. I'm going to uh, go through it with you slowly. Uh, every five years, the Lancet Commission is publishing this um, 
mise à jour. And uh, they have listed in the middle, in blue, the number 12, the number, the 12 uh, preventable factors for dementia. So at the top, you see diabetes, then high blood pressure at midlife. Midlife is uh, 40 to 65, eh? so uh, some of you are getting close to that. Um, obesity at midlife, physical inactivity, depression, that could be any age, um, smoking, uh, low education, hearing loss, this is important, and some people in the room here are really experts on that. I'll just finish the list before going back uh, with comments. Traumatic brain injury, you know about uh, rugby players, football players, the uh, boxers. Yeah, it's a lot of tau changes in their brain. It looks a little different from Alzheimer kind of tau pathology, but uh, they do have a, a distinct dementia. High alcohol consumption, so that would be more than three glasses a day. Ah, ah aren't you relieved? There's a bit of a debate in Canada now. What should be the minimum? It's one glass a day. Okay. Even some studies suggest you should quit altogether, but then you'll get depressed. <laughs> just, just one glass a day. Social isolation and air pollution. Uh, surprise. Air pollution made it to a recognized risk factor. We're lucky in BC. Uh, not, this is not such an issue, but imagine India and China. And Thailand right now, I mean, so anyway, it's, it's a new factor that uh, can be modified, we, we hope. But that's a societal level kind of thing, something. So novel risk factors being studied further for the next iteration, next year or two. Loneliness, hopelessness, stress, sleep disturbances. So just a word about sleep. It is indeed been found that you have sleep apnea or very poor sleep. Uh, it, it interferes with your clearing uh, meloid out of your brain during a REM sleep. So another way, another way to say that if you have poor REM sleep, you, you interfere with the natural clearing of beta meloid out of your body, out of your brain and then outside your body. So sleep better. Um, impaired oral health. This is important. And unfortunately, in long-term care, you agree, uh, we don't brush teeth regularly, we don't gargle, but you shouldn't wait. It, it, um, the bacteria, uh, the microbiome of the gums uh, may play a role in chronic inflammation. That's one way to look at it. So uh, it, it's, a, it's being investigated as a potential significant modifiable risk factor, but you don't have to wait for the next publication. Brush your teeth now. And yeah, uh, COVID-19 is the wild card. The long COVID, we don't know what it will do to brain aging. Uh, it's too early to tell, but uh, it's a bit of a wild card. So can you use this information now for prevention studies? So let's see what happens. So this is one small observation study done in the US, uh, just to give you examples of what you will read about in the literature if you type prevention, dementia. So this is an example of a study where they looked at diabetes, which will increase your risk of dementia by 1.6, physical inactivity, 1.6 roughly, and obesity, 1.7. But if you have all three, you're more likely, you understand? So, so if you're 50 year old, diabetic, you're not active physically and you're obese, well, yeah, you, you have a high risk of dementia. There's no way around it. It may be a mixed dementia, vascular factors are here at play. Um, but if you act on that aggressively, yeah, you, you should have a delay in dementia for those individuals or that group of individuals. In China, they looked at healthy risk factors and impact on uh, associated memory decline. So it's a study over 10 years. There were 60 year old at the start of the study, most of them. And to make a long story short, if you um, have multiple good habits, you have a lower risk of memory decline over 10 years. And even if you, if you have a APOE4, one copy from one side of the family, you also have lowering of the risk. So you sort of compensate for the genetic risk from if you have it just from one side of the family with those healthy risk factors. So uh, if you can read from a distance, healthy diet, I'll give you the specifics of what's a Chinese healthy diet. Next, regular physical exercise, active social contacts, active cognitive activity, no smoking, no alcohol, that's harsh, but um, that's the way they defined it. And uh, these are the figures. Um, and, 
And I'll tell you a secret. They also found the same thing for uh, lowering the risk of dementia. This was a risk of um, memory decline with age, but the same finding, if you have those healthy habits, you lower the risk of dementia over 10 years. Um, the, here's the diet, in case you were curious. Um, so seven out of 12 food items or more, you, this is the healthy diet for the Chinese study. Fruits, vegetables, fish, meat, all the expensive stuff, right? <laughs> <laughs> Dairy products, salt, oil, eggs, cereals, legumes, I'm not sure what it is in different China, and nuts and tea, lots of tea. Okay. So just to summarize this part, uh, there's a new biological definition of Alzheimer ATN that uh, in a way facilitates research. Um, but we should be clear that dementia in, in most people over age 85 is a combination of other things. It's not just amyloid. Uh, the vascular factors, um, small strokes, uh, neuroinflammation, uh, alpha synuclein is the Parkinson related protein change. TDP43 is the new kid on the block. It's a protein that builds up, uh, especially with people over age 90. And it tends to cause a decline in memory, not so much a big dementia. Um, and it causes a shrinking of the hippocampi, as we were discussing this morning. So a 95-year-old person with dementia, even if we say it's Alzheimer, it's not going to be the same protein mix as a 65-year-old, okay? Uh, triad and other cohorts, uh, like the CCNA cohorts called Compass and D, are ways we study the natural history of memory decline um, and uh, biomarkers related to biomarkers. Uh, and observational studies done uh, in various countries like US, China, uh, they help to, def to, to refine the list of um, protective and risk factors. So now I'm going to talk about what do you do about it? Uh, can you use this information to prevent in, in a prospective study where you randomize people? You exercise, you don't exercise. And as was discussed this morning, it's not so easy because you cannot prevent people from exercising if you happen to be in the control group. So the model is, that's used around the world is called FINGER because the study was done in Finland originally. And um, it was, um, as you read, uh, people um, were at risk a little bit, um, age 60 to 77, uh, over 1,000 people. And over two years, Half of them, regular health advice or a combination. This is the key word here, combination of nutrition, more fish. In Finland, you probably have fish three times a day instead of twice a day. <laughs> Physical exercise with a coach, eh, you wish. Cognitive training with a small group. It pays, it's actually more effective to be with a small group when you do cognitive exercises. And social activity. So the full package. Bon. So what happened after two years? Not much, but uh, you see uh, here um, the main outcomes. Um, the, the red is people who had the full package. Um, everybody got better, by the way. I don't know if it's clear. All, all, everybody got better because you were in a study. So just being um, usual care, it means you were tested <laughs> at some intervals and you felt you were part of a study. So there's a um, hot turn effect. There's a placebo effect, even in a non-drug study. So everybody got better. But those who got the package, they, they actually, as you see, they were thinking faster, processing speed. They were able to make decisions faster about how to spend their money. That's executive functioning. The memory didn't change that much. That, that's the thing on the left. What really paid more so the, 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 the size of change is statistically significant, but uh, it's not huge. Um, what really uh, happens is if you follow these people over five years, ah, there's a lasting benefit beyond the two years. And 20% uh, lower risk of cardiovascular events, 30% lower risk of functional decline, uh, better health-related quality of life. Uh, so the... Um, the preventive strategy, which is a combination of things, has an effect that's sort of immediate, but not huge, but it, it sort of increased over time, over five years, six years, beyond the two year of intervention. 
the other thing that came out is even if you, even if you start um, with um, the genetic risk, APOE4, from one side of the family, you compensate for that with the exercise package, cognitive test, good diet, etc. You can offset this genetic risk. So in the next generation of trials along those lines is a bit similar. You have um, the combination of exercise and things, but some people are randomized in addition to have a medication such as a metformin. Metformin, the old diabetes medicine being tested to prevent dementia? Huh, yeah, it's because there's a metabolic component of brain aging which is coming back in fashion. And these are old drugs that we know well, and uh, these are not diabetic people. So they're getting metformin under careful supervision, and uh, we'll see if that's an additional bonus to prevent brain aging. But you really understand, we're talking about two, three years studies now? maybe five years to really see an effect because you start with pretty normal people to start with. So it will take time to, to see changes. So if you sign up for studies like that, just be available for five years. So the finger has moved to different countries, including Canada. So it's called Can Thumbs Up. And um, I'll just give you the highlights. So it's called Synergic Trials. It's a combination of um, exercise, especially for improvement of gait and for cognition. And uh, there was one arm of the study with vitamin D supplements. Um, so the first study was more like feasibility. Can we do this during the pandemic? So 200 people signed up. They were MCI to start with, age 60 to 85. Um, and to make a long story short, uh, people did uh, pretty much uh, complete the the, the six months, it was short, six months, yeah. Uh, it was a combination of cognitive training, physical exercise, vitamin D. Because of the pandemic, it had to be done online. It did work. And uh, the first cut of the effects on um, 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 memory tests, uh, it's a complex memory test, uh, but there is a difference for those who were on the, the full package and uh, it still needs to be uh, finalized and published. So that particular Canadian study now will be expanded further. Vitamin D did not seem to add anything, perhaps because we're already well on vitamin D supplements. Uh, maybe it was uh, not necessary, and uh, that's that. So just to finish, um, read the book. So <laughs> the World Alzheimer Reports 2021-2022, which are available online, one is about diagnosis, one is about treatment. The one on management treatment has a full chapter on prevention. There you go. So uh, you can get it online at Al's, Alzheimer Int International, alzint.org. And chapter 23 is about strategies towards dementia risk reduction, which is really the way we should be thinking. Dementia risk reduction, delay of symptoms progression. And uh, you have uh, articles written by uh, key people uh, uh, ranging from atrial fibrillation. So if you, it's more like an individual approach. If you are uh, at the age of 65, you have atrial fibrillation, should you go on blood thinners? Yes, because you will prevent strokes and prevent cognitive decline. It uh, allows me to say a word about Ontario being a leader in Canada for stroke reduction pre-pandemic there was a significant decrease in number of people with strokes in Ontario because they were really treating uh, TIAs, uh, warnings of strokes, very uh, well. And uh, they were starting to see a decrease in number of people with dementia in Ontario before the pandemic. So this is a trend to, to keep up in BC and Quebec. Uh, let's treat the vascular risk factors at least very well. And... Um, I think on the cake would be the full package. Exercise more, go out with your neighbors, uh, play bridge, get a dog, get a girlfriend, eat fish, although it's expensive. <laughs> so to summarize, I tried to give you an overview of the field. You'll need to read more because it is complex and it has to be individualized. So my message uh, is, um, yeah, keep reading about it, but um, talk to your doctor because you don't want to go on a drinking only green tea <laughs> that would be boring but that that could be one thing you do because you read about it um and volunteer as um 
sign up as volunteers. There's different studies around the, the country and uh, there's one in, out of California you can sign up with. Uh, you do the test online. And one, one good thing about being a volunteer is they, they will let you know if you're changing. There's, if you agree <laughs> to be contacted, if there is a clinically meaningful something that's detected, you may be a... You may be told ahead of time, hey, there's a change in your memory test. There is this happening. Talk to your doctor. And uh, again, uh, the MOCA validation is something you can get, get involved with. Just uh, write at that address. Thank you for your attention.